Excellent. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, it's great to be here. It's a fantastic session. I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot, and I want to uh, thank uh, Bruno, Lisa, and Franco for, for organizing. Um, so this presentation, I'm going to talk uh, about reactivity and alkali release of uh, non-conventional pozzolans. More specifically, uh, we're going to look at three sources of calcium clays, three sources of uh, volcanic ash, or also known as raw natural pozzolans, uh, three sources of ground bottom ash, which come from the same type of utilities as uh, conventional fly ash, and two sources of uh, fluidized bed combustion, or FBC fly ash. And these come uh, from a different type of coal burning utility, where uh, they burn the coal at about half the temperature, about 800 degrees C, and as such, many of the non-combustible phases, such as clays and quartz and all that, do not melt. So you get this um, kind of a semi-angular and, and porous nature in, in, the, in the ash. I want to acknowledge the uh, great contribution of my co-authors as well as funding from Federal Highway Administration. Uh, this is interesting because it's a, <laughs> I feel like I updated this uh, presentation and it's, uh, it's not the, the most updated one, but it, okay. I'll try to stick to the slides that I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, um, First, I want to show this uh, classical uh, ternary phase diagram, which uh, uh, we have the uh, silica essentially at the at the top, and uh, the sum of uh, the sum of calcium and alkalis on, on, on one corner, and aluminum and, and iron on, on the other corner. And uh, the blue dots over here are essentially volcanic ashes. And we see about 85% uh, or so uh, silicon oxide and about a little less than 10% sum of calcium and alkalis. Uh, our calcium clays are uh, clustered over here, and, uh, practically no calcium and a combination of silicon and aluminum and iron. And uh, then we have a, a kind of a plume of these uh, uh, coal-based uh, pozzolans, uh, which include uh, 25 conventional ashes, which I just show here as a benchmarking uh, with uh, some uh, ground bottom ashes, as well as fluid as bed combustion ashes. Um, we looked at the characterization of these, uh, starting from uh, ASDM C618, and uh, data that you're looking at here essentially includes the sum of oxide, silicon, aluminum, and iron, calcium oxide, sulfur oxide, and so on. Um, pretty much we meet all of the, these 11 pozzolans meet uh, the uh, requirements set forth in ASTM C618, um, with the exception of one point uh, where we have one of these um, FBC ashes have um, sulfur content of 8%, which is above the 5% limit, and this is because of the way that they desulfurize flue gas in, in these uh, power plants, uh, that they essentially inject lines directly into the boiler, and that results in precipitation of uh, and hydrides uh, that is captured together with, with ash. So if you have a high sulfur core that you're burning, you end up with a high sulfur ash in the form of uh, having anhydride contamination. Uh, the other um, notable observations is the issue of LOI. If you look at the uh, essentially left side of this uh, uh, table, uh, we see that the, uh, the LOIs are you know, the, the LOI of the natural pozzolans or uh, calcium clays and uh, volcanic ashes, even if they are elevated, do not correspond with the carbon content, which makes sense, but it's, it's, a, it's a point of uh, kind of reassurance that uh, if these materials are higher LOI, that does not mean that they are, um, you know, there are potential air and treatment problems. Um, on the other hand, we see for the coal-based products, the, the LOI and the, the carbon content are more in sync and, and um, uh, the next uh, point is about the alkali content of these natural pozzolans that we see, or, or volcanic ashes that we see, they are elevated, and we'll talk about some of the availability of these later on. And finally, the, the issue of the amorphous content. So we look at this draw, we see the amorphous content go anywhere between uh, about 19% to about 100%. So some of these um, uh, pozzolans have quite a bit of uh, crystalline materials. Some of those crystals are reactive, such as anhydrite and lime, um, and um, some of those crystals are non-reactive, such as quartz and feldspars and hematite and things like that. Um, we looked at a correlation, or we kind of captured the reactivity using different methods. Primarily, we looked at strain activity index as well as the R2 test. 
On the left, you see the strain activity index of the 11 materials measured both at seven days and 28 days. And um, uh, it's, it's uh, graphed against the amorphous content of these materials. And, and you see there is a very weak correlation, if any, between the amorphous content and strain activity index. So essentially, the amorphous content is not a good predictor. Uh, initially, uh, you know, as, as we all know, there are uh, criticisms against these tests, so we kind of uh, file that about strain activity being not a very good measure of reactivity. So we, we looked at the bound water and the heat release in the R3 test, uh, and uh, we got the graph uh, on the right-hand side, and we see, again, there is no uh, you know, good predictability of the amorphous content of the reactivity. And there are ver various reasons for this. Uh, amorphous content doesn't account for the fineness of these pozzolans. Uh, not all amorphous or not all glassy materials are similarly reactive, and there are crystalline, uh, uh, you know, reactive crystalline uh, materials that are in, in, in these pozzolans. Um, if we look at the physical properties, we essentially looked at particle size distribution, density, fineness, strain activity index, water requirement, and soundness. Uh, so kind of the take-home message is that all physical properties uh, met what uh, uh, ASTM C618 uh, recommends uh, or requires. The one small exception is that for calcium clays, the water requirements is 115%, and one of the calcium clays was just slightly above that. As I mentioned, uh, we measured uh, the reactivity using the R3 test. I'm sure everybody has learned R3 test inside and out, and I'm going to suggest Panoid to make the quiz on that subject. So I'm not going to go through the, you know, how, how the test is done. Uh, but essentially, we, we used the R3 test, and we uh, looked at these uh, uh, 11 materials and, uh, you know, over seven days heat. Uh, and we looked at the, the threshold that was recently recommended by Wylam for 90% confidence interval of reactivity that you need to have a heat release of um, 160 uh, joule per uh, gram SEM, and we see that all of these pozzolans uh, exceed that. Uh, so with a 90% confidence, they are pozzolanically reactive. Um, and also we see that the calcium clays, which are shown with these red curves, uh, are uh, uh, the highest reactivity. Uh, one of the other observations uh, to kind of uh, uh, you know, co corroborating what, what Safe just mentioned is uh, we see that uh, quite a few of these curves are not plateauing at seven days, so they, they continue to react over time. Uh, we also measured the bound water, and uh, the bound water, we measured it up to 28 days, and again, the, the, the Rylam uh, recommendation is a seven-day value of 4.5 gram uh, and, uh, of bound water. Uh, which all of these materials exceed with a 90% uh, percent, uh, confidence being pozzolanic. And we see that for, again, for many of these materials, the, the bound water continue to increase past seven days. Um, this slide, we're looking at some of the correlation between these, uh, these R3 metrics. And I think Kevin has alluded on, on, on some of these with using a much larger uh, data set. Uh, but for, for our 11 materials, on the uh, left-hand side, we see the amount of reacted calcium hydroxide versus the heat release uh, that, um, you know, there is a reasonably good correlation. And um, on, on the right, we see the bound water versus heat release, again, a uh, reasonably good correlation. Okay. Um, we also benchmarked these uh, 11 uh, SCMs against uh, some of the data that is available in the literature, and one of the additions that I made to this presentation after seeing Frank's talk uh, was uh, essentially borrowing a, a, a graph from, from the paper, the Ryland paper that you were referring to that has a larger data set of uh, the, the R3 results on, on, uh, on pozzolans. So unfortunately, this, this graph didn't make it here. But if we just look at the table, um, we um, this is before the, the phase three Ryland work that or public, uh, you know, publication of that. Uh, so these are kind of from from different sources. We managed to look at data for 19 class F ashes, C, six class C ashes, one slag, one silica fume, four um, inert fillers, and then we com uh, compared the uh, results that we see uh, for our 11 pozzolans. Uh, 
Um, you, if you look at the averages and ranges, and again, that, that graph that didn't make it to this presentation would be a better visual illustration of that. We see that uh, based on the heat release that we measured in the R3 test, uh, assuming if, you know, if we accept that this is a good measure of the ozonic reactivity, uh, calcium clays are significantly more reactive than conventional fly ashes and have reactivities that are more similar in the range of uh, silica fuel and slag. So you look at these values, uh, 510 to 580 versus 600, which is the average of the three calcium clays. Um, ground bottom ashes uh, uh, tend to, or, or show to have a reactivity that were comparable with the top 50 percentile of class F ashes. So they were better than average fly ashes. And uh, the, the other two materials, the volcanic ashes and the FPC fly ashes, were similar to an average class F fly ash. Okay. Uh, one other um, uh, point uh, was we also looked at the reaction products that form in, in the R3 test. And again, unfortunately, this slide didn't uh, show up here. Uh, but essentially, those are uh, some of the uh, usual suspects that you, you imagine that, uh, you know, as you... Uh, and make a system, if I go back to the, to the uh, composition of the R3 test, um, essentially you, there you go. So you have your SCM and calcium hydroxide, so you form CSH and calcium alumina silicate hydrate. You also have calcite uh, together with reactive alumina from SCM in the case of calcium and clay. So you, you make some carboaluminate phases as well as, um, you know, ettringite uh, and potentially monosulfate. All right, uh, now let me switch gears and talk about the um, alkali release of, of these pozzolans. Um, uh, so the graph that we're looking at here is uh, the, um, um, it, it essentially the, the blue lines show, the blue bars show the total alkali content of the 11 uh, SCMs that we looked at here. Um, uh, the other two bars correspond with the available alkali test, the ASTMC 311 that, uh, that Anul also alluded to as well as a new test uh, that we're developing at Penn State, and we call it the soluble alkali test. Um, the data that you're looking at here, both of them are at 28 days. And we see that at 28 days, when these are measured against the total alkalis, uh, we see that these uh, volcanic ashes uh, look to have or seem to have high total alkali content, but about 25 to 30 percent of those total alkalis seem to be, quote unquote, available, um, you know, based on these, these two tests. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the Penn State test. So essentially, in this test, we're looking at exposing our SCM to a high um, uh, pH uh, solution to simulate the pore solution without the presence of portlandite. So we don't want to have any precipitation of reaction products. We want to just see how much alkalis are dissolving from the SCM into that solution. So we take a one normal sodium hydroxide and we track the release of potassium from SCM into that. And then we, we do a one normal uh, potassium hydroxide and we track the release of sodium into that solution. Um, 38C, uh, when we extract solutions or we take samples at um, given days, we measure, uh, we analyze them with ICP to look at sodium potassium buildup over time. Yeah. Uh, so here's one kind of a, uh, uh, you know, look at uh, one set of data of only for volcanic ashes. Uh, so on the left, we're looking at the soluble potassium um, and as a function of time. And uh, the, the dashed lines show the total amount of potassium that is available, meaning that, or that, that, that could dissolve, meaning that if all of the potassium from the SCM could dissolve in the solution, these were the, these are the va values that we would get. So we expect that the amount that dissolves is going to be much less. We hope that the amount that dissolves is going to be much less. If we look at a snapshot at 28 days, we see that the, these values are about 25 to 30 percent of the values of the dashed lines. But we do see that the potassium continues to build up in the solution. So there is this risk that over time we are going to dissolve uh, quite a bit. Uh, one other point that I mentioned, kind of listening to Anul, in his talk, he was looking at volcanic ashes that, that had a lot of alkali-bearing crystalline phases. In, in our case, at least two of our ashes are um, highly amorphous, 90 plus to 100% amorphous and still high alkali. So it doesn't mean that, you know, 
that all natural pozzolans would, would necessarily behave the same or all of them release a lot of alkalis. Uh, but for these, it, it looks like there is a uh, you know, reasonable amount of alkali release. On the sodium, we don't see that effect. We see the alkali release has plateaued by 56 days. Um, this test does not account for any alkali binding into CSH. And there was conversation about the calcium to silica ratio of the effect of the CSH. Some of these pozzolans can produce low C over S uh, CSHs that have high capacity for bonding alkalis. And th those are all valid points. So we decided to look at uh, the actual pore solution uh, in cement paste that are made with these pozzolans. Uh, we, we make a one um, a control for, uh, cement paste with a high alkali cement, 1.04%, uh, two duplicate uh, cement paste with 20% replacement of cement with uh, quartz flour, and, uh, uh, and the uh, 11 uh, mixes with 20% replacement with these pozzolans. Um, and we look at the, um, uh, the, essentially the data, the, the, the pH of the pore solution as a function of time. So, uh, on the left here, we're looking at volcanic ashes. Uh, uh, this black line corresponds with the Portland cement system. Uh, uh, the, uh, so no SCM. The, the uh, green corresponds with 20% of cement is replaced with the filler. So we're purely looking at the alkali dilution because we took out some cement. And then um, uh, the, the other ones are all the, the mixes with volcanic ash. So. Um, if the volcanic ash doesn't contribute any alkalis more than it bounds, it should act like a filler in, in the form of, you know, alkali release or pH. But we do see that the pH is lower, so it suggests that the net contribution is more binding of alkalis than it, than it contributes. But that, this does not mean that it's necessarily, or at least these three, are necessarily effective to mitigate ASR for any aggregates at, at the dosages that were tested. So... Um, you know, in our experience, a 13.6 pH is a safe threshold uh, to uh, to go. Essentially, if you want to mitigate ASR, you have to be below that point. And uh, this also, if I did my math correctly, this corresponded with the value that Anol mentioned for for an R2 aggregate. So essentially, you want to be below this this value. And um, maybe at a longer time with volcanic ashes, we'll get there. Maybe higher dosage than 20% is needed. Uh, for comparison, on the right side, you see the calcine clays, and you see that essentially they are doing a better job at reducing pH, reducing the ASRS. Okay. Um, I want to wrap up with conclusions. So we looked at uh, 11 total materials. Um, they all met ASTM C618 limits, except for one of the FPC ashes that had high uh, uh, SO3 content. Um, all 11 materials um, were, could be classified as pozzolanically reactive with 90% uh, confidence. Uh, calcine clays showed uh, the highest reactivity, um, uh, and uh, the, the other three were comparable with class F fly ashes. We saw that the amorphous content is not a good predictor of the pozzolanic reactivity. Uh, for this uh, available or the soluble alkali test, we saw that the volcanic ashes continue to dissolve potassium over time. And this is something that we we'll have to look into more carefully and see how much this, this uh, contributes to uh, the risk of ASR. But in the, uh, in the form of pore fluid studies, we see that volcanic ashes, and, and in fact, all of these that we, or the majority of the ones that we tested, are a net remover of alkalis. The question is, do, we, do they remove enough alkalis to, to mitigate ASR or not? Among the four classes, calcium clays were the, uh, were the best. Thank you.